the breakup of the United Kingdom. It is far better to become aware of our deceptions while we still have time to change. But sadly, it is often only when one is at death's doorstep that they come to recognize the vanity and falseness of their existence up to that point. However, while enjoying the fruits of his labors, he becomes afflicted by a terminal illness and reflecting deeply on the meaning of life, is haunted by a nagging feeling that his life was wasted. It is as if I had been going downhill while I imagined I was going up. And that is really what it was. I was going up in public opinion, but to the same extent life was ebbing away from me. And now it is all done and there is only death. This passage by Tolstoy strikes at the root of the danger of living at the mercy of our self-deceptions. Because if we opened our borders today mm. to the United Kingdom, we saw what happened in Germany, mm. where we saw millions of people from Syria alone just going into that country. Mm. Now, the problem with the United Kingdom is that if we open the borders, where people recognize that they, when they arrive here, they will be given accommodation, mm. that there is money available for them immediately, and that there is the immigration industry that's willing to support them, we will have double mm. the number that went to uh, Germany mm. within a year or two. Of course, there were, like with many other policies, plenty of unintended consequences of this policy. So due to changes in migration policies, there were some you know, unintended consequences here. So as migrants from the Commonwealth were no longer permitted to travel freely between their home nation and the UK, they generally chose to settle permanently in the UK, whereas before there was more circularity in their movements. This led to a large wave also of family reunification into the UK and actually increased migration to some extent. Previously, the mainly male migrant population um, that came alone to the UK started to change. So migration was largely seen as something temporary permanently and as a way in which to earn enough money in the UK in order to live comfortably in their home country. But when faced with the choice to leave permanently or remain in the UK, Many stayed with the hope of a better future for their families, and this led to a large influx of families, which has led to generations of migrants and descendants of migrants now calling the UK their home. Our institutions are still living with a colonial hangover. The elected parliamentarians of independent India say I and no when voting in the House. Those in favor may say aye. Those against may say no. Have you noticed the attire of the Darwans standing beside the Speaker of the Lok Sabha and the Chairman of the Rajya Sabha? Colonial. Judges in India are still referred to as my Lord and your Honour, Lordship. And I don't even want to get started on how our judicial system with all the paperwork is so British. Well, I was born in England and England's a country, so am I English? So what's your ethnicity? Well, that's not what I'm asking you, though, because Anglo-Saxon is... That's what I'm asking you. No, but English is, not, you English is not, in my head, an ethnicity. English well, is a well, country. And well, Anglo you, Hold on, sorry, Oswald, let me, let me tell you what I think. Anglo-Saxon is an ethnicity, and England is a country. So I'm wondering what... So because, by the way, there's no such ethnicity as Pakistani either, Oswald. Pakistan was a country created in 1947 out of about five ethnicities. Well, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not a learned historian about your, the past of well, your Well, you don't have to apologise for... Well, it's not my country. Britain's my country, Oswald. What about the use of Sevadar or Sahayaks in the Indian Army? There has been so much hue and cry about it. The British pitted religions and ethnic groups against each other. Independent India continues to embrace that divide. The Ministry of Defence is determined to ensure that as few British soldiers as possible are white and that those who are white are made to feel ashamed of the colour of their skin. It's only in recent decades that I've seen a lot of mentions of black culture and white privilege, and the two subjects seem to appear more and more both in my morning newspaper and also on the internet. We still follow the British education system, and we still do not give our children the freedom to innovate. They're enslaved by grades and test scores, the vices of the British education system. To this end, a training day was held on February the 8th called Operation Teamwork. All participants, and this was designed to include everybody in the army, 
was expected to read and agree with a document called the Psychosis of Whiteness. The Psychosis of Whiteness. This is all part of a wider strategy which is aimed at decolonizing the British Army. This is not a situation of my making, but I don't see why I should ignore it, especially since much of what is being said is damaging to society, injurious to Britain, and extremely irritating into the bargain. Well, nobody cared. Now he makes it a political issue. It's a political issue. He demands recognition, respect, human rights, and he rallies a ra large group of people. And there are violent clashes between him and police, his group and, and ordinary people, no matter what. It's black against white, yellows against green, doesn't matter where his division line goes. As long as this group come into antagonistic clash, sometimes militantly, sometimes with firearms, that is the stabilization process called the psychosis of whiteness the psychosis of whiteness gents do any of you have a pilot who is preferably not white male who would like to be the RAF face at a press event from the release of Top Gun 2 so that they can learn that the idea of whiteness is a dangerous mental illness let me begin by reading the first few lines from the abstract Critical whiteness studies has emerged as an academic discipline that has produced a lot of work and garnered attention in the last two decades. Central to this project is the idea that if the processes of whiteness can be uncovered, then they can be reasoned with and overcome through rational dialogue. Perhaps those who accuse me of being obsessed with race and skin colour would like to hear that again. Freedom was not supposed to be a mere change of hands. How can we call ourselves independent if we do not have the freedom to make our choices? A woman still cannot rise up the ranks of the Indian Army. Indian attire is not modern enough for so many. High tea and English breakfast are signs of having arrived. We wear gowns at graduation ceremonies. We shun dark skin. Our police force is still lati charge. English remains a vehicle of social mobility. We love Shashi Tharoor for voluminous diction, but we question the need to be fluent in our vernacular. Britain's Royal Air Force is actually ashamed of the fact that white men are serving in the Air Force and hope to conceal this fact by sending a black person, hopefully a woman, to represent them at an international press conference. This article will argue, however, that whiteness is a process rooted in the social structure, one that induces a form of psychosis, framed by its irrationality, which is beyond any rational engagement. So, whiteness causes psychosis, called the psychosis of whiteness, the psychosis of whiteness. And I'm the one who is preoccupied with skin colour and ethnicity. We know all about the British royal family, but we know nothing about the Satvahanas. The point I'm making is very simple. India has achieved a lot. No one can take away that from us. But many Indians still need to break free. Fifteen years ago, he did his dirty job and nobody cared. Now he makes it a political issue. It's a political issue. He demands recognition, respect, human rights. And he rallies a ra large group of people where the division line goes. As long as this group come into antagonistic clash, sometimes militantly, sometimes with firearms, that is the stabilization process. The sleepers, many of whom are simply KGB agents, become leaders of the process of destabilization for his legitimate uh, struggle for. I don't know, human rights, women rights, kid lib, prison lib, whatever. There are sympathetic Americans who donate their money to him. This stabilization process usually leads directly to the process of crisis. I don't think so. I know that for a fact. It seems that you were right all along, at least according to this barrister hired by a black man. It is not me who is obsessed with skin colour and ethnicity. 
When the Royal Air Force doesn't want a, black, uh, a white man to represent them, and the black man claims that it is part of his culture to make a racket in public and disturb other people, I can hardly remain silent. It's a mental illness of such severity that the sufferer loses touch with reality and cannot tell the difference between what is real and what is a hallucination. You know, so one day England won't be English people here, it'll be all foreigners. Therefore, in the eyes of the law, the UK Parliament simply acts as a sovereign body and the precedence it sets in doing so makes it sovereign according to court rulings.